So we have one last hands-on. For the hands-on, uh, we need to use the material from the um, Google Drive. Google Drive program file day three, and uh, please download it, the zip file in your like Dropbox, uh, no, desktop or any folder you know. After you download it, just unzip it. So now we have the folder called P five uh, P five static uh, status takes MS day three. So in this hands-on, our last hands-on section, we will go over um, the we will go over PCA um, heat map, which is cluster, and the very last step we will um, try we will learn how to build a classific a classifier, and then. If we still have time, we can uh, have a try to see how the sample size estimation function works for the classification problem. Because I, uh, in minus <coughs> in MS that's um, hands on, we have already learned how to estimate calculate the sample size for hypothesis testing. Hypothesis testing is just to see to find the differential abundant proteins across two groups. But now we will learn how to estimate the sample size for classification problem. So okay, then let's start. So in the folder, let's again to first build a uh, project for day three. Open R Studio. Okay, it's my R Studio. And then new project existing directory. Go to the directory. We just you just put the folder. I put it in my desktop. So set it uh, set it as the working directory. Create project. So today, um, since we need to go over like four different topics, we will not uh, type them um, a step by step. I put all the R scrim, R command, all the code in the R scrim here. So please first open the R scrim for section six. It's in the folder called. Uh, 9 a.m. Huang section 6R. After you open that, you can see a such screen, our screen. If, okay. Um, if you have already had this screen, please put the blue note on your left. So in this screen, we will see how now we have, so we have already, uh, imagine you have your own data set and you run MSDS or MSDS-TMT, you have the protein abundance data metric. And uh, how, you, how can you do like a PCA analysis or how can you do a um, heat map, make a heat map plot you, we will run that from this R scrim. So in this R scrim, you will see we will make different plots. So today is this hands-on session most like, uh, likely is like a uh, database hands-on. So um, Olga, in Olga's lecture, she just introduced a colorectal, the case study, which is a colorectal <coughs> cancer study. We will use exactly that data set to, uh, as an example data set to do the hands-on. Um, just a, a reflect, a recall memory about the data set, we, for that colorectal data, data set, it has training and the validation. Training cohort and the validation cohort. And for 
training cohort, it has one, uh, 100 subjects from control, which is healthy, and uh, 100 samples from disease, colorectal cancer. And in validation cohort, it also has 100, I think 100 subjects from health and 169 from colorectal cancer. So in our, uh, in today's uh, hands-on, in this hands-on, we will see whether we can separate the colorectal cancer and the control group. But remember the data set is uh, like clinical data set. So it's not specky. In specky, we can expect that we, it's quite not very hard to separate the two groups. But in, uh, in this cl uh, clinical data set, uh, we will see that it's hard to see the difference, to separate the diff different groups. Okay, now we, let's first, so in the CRC data set, the colorectal cancer data set, we in a build a data, so in Bell Conductor, you can also build a data package, which you put your data set in, your, in that package. So Mina made a R package called MS that's Bell data, this one. So in that data set, um, there are different several uh, peak intensity data set we have used for, uh, for MS that's. Then the colorectal cancer data set is also available in that data set. So then we need to first uh, elaborate, load that data set, the uh, MS that's Bell data set. Bell data package, and then we need to load the data set, the raw spectra, the not, not raw, the pre-processed peak intensity data for colorectal cancer. Then, like first step, we need to elaborate the MS that Bell data package. I think in our in the R screen, if you have, I think in the R uh, R screen for installing the package we have asked you to install that package if you have problem with the package please put the pink note and uh, for this package we will load our required data set okay so if you don't have the exact the bell conductor um no ms that's a bell data package what you can do is so open your browser like here, build uh, and the search bell conductor. Sorry, it should be bell conductor. The package name MS that's bell bell data. And the first link is the package. So it is Bell Conductor MS that's Bell Data. And then under that you can just see how the how to install it. Copy the code here. Copy the code in the code here and run it in in the R screen in R Studio. Like here. So, if you don't have the package, you can install it by these two commands. I see no. I think some like a similar problem as before. They may require you to install more um, package. Um, okay, so basically the first step we just run MS that again to get the protein abundance output. If you have some trouble to install the package uh, MS that and our uh, MS that um, bell data, I put the protein abundance data in your in the same folder. So if you have trouble with the MSDS 
all the bell conductor uh, MS that's bell data package. You can just uh, skip the first uh, step. Uh, I think first uh, step, which uh, which generates the protein abundance. Because here, see this file, the trend abundance REA. I put the protein abundance data in that R in that uh, in that uh, RDA file. So. For the, all the following analysis, we will use the protein abundance in that file. But as a very very beginning step, I want to show you how you can get that protein abundance metric from MSDAT. But if you have trouble, you are fine. You can just directly use read that train abundant RDA file into your R Studio and do all the following analysis like PCA or everything. You can do that from after you read. So if you have trouble with the MSDS or the um, bell, bell data package, please uh, read that, click train abundance RDA, and then read it into your R Studio. So after you read it, you will have the protein abundance data matrix. You can directly click it here, and it will read in the RDA file. The ID, uh, the IDA file has the protein abundance data. So the very last step, the first step, all the first step here, is just to show you how you get the protein abundance from. Basically, you need to after you have the raw data. If you have the raw data, which is uh, SMCLC here, you can first read it into MSDS, or uh, in, read it into R Studio, and then run some. So in this in this data set, uh, I think Olga probably mentioned we have two standard proteins, and we use those two standard proteins to do the normalization. So since the Proteins has already used for normalization. When we do the classification, we should remove those two uh, proteins. It's very specific for this data set. If you have your own data set, you don't need to. But if you have some standard proteins, you should also remove that. If you don't have, you just don't need to worry. Here, we this in this step, we just remove the two standard proteins. I see. Here is not we remove the two standard proteins. And after we remove the two standard proteins, We can run data precise. So now we have our raw data, and then we can run the data process from MSDS to estimate the protein abundance. So it may take us if you it may take like a half minutes to run the data process. Since the data set doesn't have, it's an RCM data set, so it only have like 70 proteins. It's not a large data set. And then, so after you have, after you run the data process here, it will return you a list which has all the information. But for classification or PCA, what we need is exactly a data, a protein abundance matrix which is like the row is different, so the column is different proteins of different genes, and the row is different patients or um, different like a cell line. So that's the matrix we need for our class, all the following analysis. So then there is another function in MSDS which is called quantification. It will give you exactly the protein abundance matrix. So you can output the protein abundance matrix from it to do all the uh, all the other analysis. So after you run data process, you can run quantification. Then you will get the train abundant. In train abundant, it has the protein abundance matrix. I think if you have trouble with the MS test. After you read the RDA file in the folder, you will get exactly the same, the same, uh, same data here as here. So, either you do all the 
before uh, the command to get the train abundant, or you can directly read it from the folder. If you have the data, you can, if you can see this train abundant data in your R Studio, please put the blue node in front of you. The previous step I just teach you how to get the protein abundance matrix from MSDS. And after you have the protein abundance matrix, let's see how does it looks like. See, you, uh, if you click, we run, we want to run the head train, we will run the line 27. It may be different from yours because I put some empty and then here. So head, we want to show the first six row of the abundance matrix, the the matrix. As you see, so in MS does it will return a matrix, the column is different subject, and the row is different protein. But in order to remember, like in order to see which row is which protein corresponding to which protein, MS does has a one additional column which is called protein. And um, it put all the protein names. Then, but the matrix we need is exact. We only need the the subject columns. We don't want. We don't need the protein column. So, but we still need to remember what protein, like it, which row is which protein. So here you need to know. So first to do is here to send. So. Here to assign the pro the column protein column as the row name, so that we can remember the which pro which row is which protein. So in that case, now if you print out the chain again, if you see again to run the first line of the. It should be oh here. Yeah. So after you uh, give after you assign the row names as the protein, if you print the first six row of the tree abundance abundance, you can see that the this this, this um matrix has a row name now. Previously there is no row name. But now we put the row name as the same as protein. And then Next step, we need to remove that protein column, which are, is the first column. So after you remove, we will run here. We remove the first column. OK. After we remove the first column, sorry, uh, if we again print out the first row of the matrix, You can see there is no protein column. Originally, before there is a pro column called protein, now there is no protein column. So here, exactly that's exactly the data matrix we can use for the following, like for classification or cluster. So see, this is a col is a matrix. The column is. Uh, different patients of uh, different subjects. The rows are there. Each row is one protein. So that's the usually if you look if you run R code or other software. Usually for classification or cluster, they will require you to have such format uh, data matrix as the input. Uh, so. Very last step. Um, it's just a tradition as like a computer science or other machine learning. Usually, we will put we will um, we will put reverse the matrix. So usually, column means different variable, and the row means different sample. So actually, we need to reverse the data matrix. Next step. So 
here and just to uh, reverse the data matrix. So now column becomes the row and the row becomes a column. So if you again to print it, it will look like this way. So now the columns are protein and row are subjects. So it's uh, not sure why, why originally they want this way, but now most of the softwares, uh, most of our package, if you want to full classification or like PC or every like a cluster, if you want to run the function, they will mostly they will want some input like this. So columns are different genes or different proteins or variables you have, and the rows are different subjects samples. That's the, some standard format uh, if when you use the R package. So in this case, now we have the we have uh, our input. I have already prepared input. Then in, we want to here. We only want to know how many samples do you have, how many proteins do you have. So there is a command we call DIM, which will tell you the dimension of the matrix. If you run it, it will return you the dimension of exactly the matrix. So the tree about the matrix dimension is we have two hundred rows, which is two hundred samples. It's training this up. And we have 70 columns, which we have means we have 70 proteins. So, oh, okay. I think I, I think when I run it, I probably forgot some skill. Uh, oh, so, so it's, I put a wrong number here. It should be 70. 70. 66 is because after that we due to missing value we remove some proteins but uh, it's the next step so now you have the if you have such matrix which columns are proteins rows are samples again to please put the blue note on our laptop <coughs> or if you have trouble you can put pink Okay, so seems uh, good. Then, so for classification or for cluster, after you have such matrix, you also need to have another vector. So usually the so. Usually, such kind of function they require as two inputs, x and y. You can see it very frequently. X is what we just generate. The columns are proteins, and the rows are different subjects. So, for example, like a sample one, two, three, and the protein one, two. Is this is the x matrix, and then we need another y. Y is usually is a vector which uh, include the annotation, the label of the sample. For example, in this case, we have sample from control, we have sample from disease. Then Y will tell us the cluster, the uh, label, like uh, the phenotype of I, each sample. In this case, for example, if sample one comes from control group, when you can, you need to put like control here, and if sample two is from CRC group, you can put CRC here. So basically, Y is the put the label information of each sample, because when you do the cluster, you uh, when you do the classification, you need so the algorithm algorithm need to know which sample from which group, so that it can train the classifier to separate the different groups. We have one data, so X is the data matrix, and Y is the group information vector. So now we have the, now we have the data matrix. Next step, we need to generate the group information vector. So if you look at closely, 
on the data metric from output from MSDS, you will find that the column, the row name here, actually is a, in MSDS is a combination of first CRC is a group and underscore P1A10 is the subject name. So in MSDS, they will put the group information plus subject ID together as the subject ID. So this give, tell us that we can ex extract the protein information uh, of the group information from the row name here. So we just need if we can get the if we can extract the information before underscore we have the group information for each sample. So then how can we how should we do that to get it? There is the command I put here. So this command here, basically you have row names. We want the row names to, to the row name here contain all the group information. So what we do here is we have row names, we want to split the row name, this string, by the underscore. We will split it in two parts. First is group information, second is subject ID. And then we will generate a data metric which has two columns. First column is the group information, the second column is the uh, subject ID. This command exactly does this same thing. So if you run it, so if you run here, do call uh, here, you will get a two column metric. Let's see how it does it. How does it look? Uh, if we print the head of it, see, that's how this matrix looks like. So it will generate exactly two columns. Yes. So, see, previously the row name is like this, and we now we separate into two columns. First column exactly is the group information. And the second column is the subject ID. So all of this is tell you just how you get the protein data matrix, how you get the group information from the MS that's output. So if you don't have MS that's output, you probably need to manually if manually create this vector. Like to we need to show like to put like um, like when we create the annotation file, you need to put annotation row by row. Here is if you have uh, MS stats, uh, if you uh, you have you have the data metric from MS stats, you can do it uh, from R code this way. Then we need to make it as a data frame. So we hope to put make it everything as a data frame, and then we give a column name. Here we do. We can know like first the group, but we need to give a column name to the metric. So first uh, column is group, second column is subject, and then we if we print out it, now we have uh, two columns, still same two columns, but they have group column name here, group and subject. Just in uh, case you can remember that. So then, okay, until uh, now we have our data metric. We have our uh, group information. So when you have those two, you can do classification and other analysis. So so now you have already uh, been you prepared very well for the next following analysis. Okay. So if you until now, if you have questions, please put pink. Or if you don't, if you have some other problem with it, please. Please put the pink notes. Okay. So, okay. Seems good. Uh, next up, before again, okay. That's all the problems when I do the like uh, analysis I have. So when I have the protein abundance, usually there is missing value in the matrix. That's quite often, especially if you do DDA, like that's quite often you, 
And even this, this is sad. It's our sad. We should expect that it's very like not too much missing value because it's um, selected. It's target analysis. But still, actually, in this data set, we can show we will look at that it still has some missing value. Then for classification, there should there should for classify even in a hypothesis testing, there should be no missing value for classification. Because it means you need to use the information from protein to predict the state of the sample. If there's one value is missing, we couldn't predict it. So then how we do if there is a missing value in the protein abundance matrix. That's our next step. So how do we deal with the missing value? But here, there is some more like a certificated um, algorithm, you know. But here we will just a very simple one. I think you can use some more. Um, but here I will introduce one very simple, you can, very simple uh, method to impute the missing value. But if you want, you can investigate like other method here. So for first, we want to know how many missing values we have. So this code is A and A in R will tell you whether the pro the value in the matrix is N A or not, and some will give us like totally how many N A we have in the data set. It means how many missing values we have in the data set. So in that case, if it's the output is we have around like 200 missing values, totally the data set there are like one um, 14,000 14, data points in the data matrix. It's, so compared with the total data points, the missing value is not that too much. So the percentage is quite low, but because it's R uh, data, but if you imagine you have DDA data, probably this percentage will be quite high here. Then we know if there's no missing value, that's a perfect case. We don't need to worry missing value. But since there is some missing value, we need to deal with it. So in very, very a uh, naive way to do it is just to remove the proteins of the samples. Also, here it should should should, should like here it should remove the proteins with any missing value. But then you will re you will here it should be proteins. So then you probably will lose lose quite many proteins. Why we want to re here why remove proteins? It, it, because we think if you there's a protein which has quite a high percentage of missing value, which means this protein is now stable. We when we build the classifier, like when we find the biomarker for some disease, we hope that the biomarker is quite stable. We can identify it or and quantify it. Um, where, like very stably across different experiments. But if their protein has a quite a high uh, percentage of missing value, we probably think it's not stable enough as a biomarker candidate. So very first way, we can, in R, there is an option called NA omit. For this command, you can remove the protein, the proteins with any missing value. After you remove that, we just need the dimension here. We want to see, OK, after we remove it, how many? Oh, sorry, it should be. I forgot a uh, transition here. So after you remove the proteins with any missing value, you will only have 64. Previously, we have 70 proteins. Uh, so I made a missing a typo here. It should be uh, a T outside of the chain about this. So it means just to, here, just to show you, if you remove the proteins, you will probably only have uh, 64 proteins. And then this is one option you can do. But since it's just uh, uh, since it's RSM, so it does you does, you don't lose too many proteins. You only lose six proteins. But uh, in other cases, probably you will lose more protein. Another option is we can impute the missing value. How we impute it? Um, 
here is very simple. So um, there are several ways to impute it. One here which provides very simple ways. So for each protein, we have like for example 100 samples. The protein has missing value in five samples. Then we want to impute the value of those five samples. Usually we do is we borrow the information from other samples. The other 95 we don't have missing value. Then we will use borrow information from the other 95 samples to impute the file missing value. In, but there are several ways to do it. You can use the median, median or you can use the mean to, of all the other 95 samples to impute it. This case, in here I just introduced very simple ways. We will assume that the missing, why, how, so usually what causes the missing value, there are like a different reason. One reason is just some random missing because there's some reason we don't know. Another more possible reason probably because the protein abundance is quite low. So and the uh, mass spectra couldn't identify it or quantify it. Still to that reason we uh, we made make an assumption that the abundance is where it's quite is low. Then when we impute it, here the, uh, the we For example, if we have protein 1, and we have um, 5 samples here, somehow um, it should be the abundance here is 2, 2, 4, 1, and in sample 5, we have a missing value. And now what are we want to impute this missing value? In this case function, it just use the minimum number. We found the minimum number of among those four values. For example, here is one, and we use one to impute it. Because the assumption we made here is about is the, because of the missing is because of the protein balance is low. So we use the minimum number to impute it. But there is, I know there are several other members you can, but always you need to make an assumption. The missing is randomly, or the missing is because of a very low abundance. If it's because low abundance, then we need to use some low number to impute the missing value. So, okay, so if we run the code, we put our, your cursor here, function, and read it into R, and then read, Another next one, you will now we have the function to impute the missing value. So in R, you always can write some. Okay, yes. Uh, sorry, which one? Can you speak? Ah, uh, that's a very tricky question. <laughs> uh, for us, if it depends on how how much what's the percentage of missing value. For this case, if the percentage of missing value is very small, I usually just use the minimum value to impute it. It's based on my own experience. But for if the but if the percentage is very large, I I will especially if the white protein the percentage of missing value is very large, I will remove that because. That even we can impute it like there, are, but that you have very few existing data points, and you want to use very small data points to impute very large data points. I don't think that makes sense. So I usually, if, if the missing value, if the percentage of missing value is very large, I will remove that specific protein. Yeah. So here we just see. Uh, oh, I will also say it's the same stuff. Here, we first know, we couldn't, uh, if there's missing value, we couldn't see. If you have missing value, I definitely can run, uh, can impute it. For this case, if there are five different samples, only, we have only one point, like two, and we have four missing value. Usually, I, I don't impute that, because you have two high, uh, large percentage of missing value. So, in that case, we will first check how much percent, how much, how, uh, what's the percentage of missing value? In that case, you, if you look at, uh, run this, 
function here, it will tell you for each protein what's the percentage of missing value. And if you just print out it, see the output here. So it's quite good that most of the protein here they, they don't have it doesn't have any missing value. But some protein like some specific protein like here, the RTG actually is a gene name. So it has a quite large percentage of missing value, like 20% of missing value. Uh, it's just some threshold. For me, I usually only keep like the missing the protein with less than 5% missing value. So then in next step, we just remove like the FGA, that protein, because it has too much, too many missing value. Then after we remove the missing value, let's see the dimension. Uh, so for this case, we will lose proteins because those four proteins have too much missing value and then for the, the still the remaining proteins it still have very few missing values and then we can use the method like you can use like mean or median here we use the minimum number to impute it so in we will impute the missing value in. So see here, for we will run that number like uh, the, it's a function name impute. We will use that function to impute the missing value. And after you run that, we will have the data matrix which doesn't have any missing value. And then we are good for our next analysis. After we have a uh, data matrix without missing value, we also have the group information. We are good to, to, we are good to make our first plot, the, our PCA plot. Uh, so in, in order to do PCA, there is a function in R which called PRC uh, COMP. In that function, if you see, okay. If you go to its help function, it is it will do the principal components analysis, and then we will use this function to do PCA analysis. So here is our imputed data matrix, and it's very simple. You just put the data matrix in your you generate and inside the function. So and you will that will give you a PCA analysis of results. So just uh, this command run PCA on the imputed protein balance matrix. So after you have the now you have already done PCA is very fast. So as long as you prepare your data set in a correct format, you can do the analysis very fast. So Usually, the difficulty when I try to run this kind of function, always the data, in the input data format is not in the, it's incorrect. So here we run PCA, and we want to know what's the what does it return. Uh, first, you can use summary. The summary will give you such kind of output. So. Here is output. Um, you will have, since you have 66 protein, so then you will have uh, the same number of uh, components. But we know the first the, comp the first uh, the component is ranked based on their, uh, based on how much of their proportion of variance, like the, based on their variance. So in this case, we see there are the first two components. Usually when we do the plot, we will only we will use the first two components. Here, the column is different components. The row here is the standard deviation, which is like the variance of the components. And the pro components here, why we see, why we rank it in this way? Because the first components will have the largest variance and the, in a descending order. So how much um, 
what is PCA is you have like a data set and for the data set you have variance, the variance, the total variance is certain and you can, and you uh, generate uh, some PCA components. We hope that the components can, the components will explain the whole the variance of whole data set. Then here is the first PC components have some variance and how what's the proportion of the variance like here is the proportion, all the components, this second row, if we cut, if we sum them up, it should equal to one because your all the components together will explain the total variance in the data set. And then the third row here is just the cumulative. So just we cumulate the second row. As you see here, the first component here, uh, it has the around like a forty percentage of the mean uh, variance. And uh, the second one has around 15 variants. So after when you have that, you can see. So for the component, that's the how what are the values the PCA analysis return. Two things which is very important is we need to first is the standard deviation, which is the variance of the component. Second is Second is something called rotation. We can also call that as loading. So I think Olga, when she uh, she also gave some explanation in her lecture, what is the rotation loading? So how we generate a PCA component, like a principal component? Uh, basically, uh, so see, uh, we have like we have five. Proteins, such as the half protein, and the usual PC1 is just the A, so P1 and A2, P2, okay. and A3, P3, and A4, P4. For example, we have four proteins here. So when we generate the PCA, we just need to make a linear combination of all the protein abundance. And then the loading here is just the coefficient for each protein. So when PCA basically is to change this coefficient to make the loading go to the direction which can has the largest variance. So the PCA is to find the coefficient here, and then loading is just A1, A2, A3, A4. So usually if A1 is very large, it means protein one contribute most to the pro PC one. That's it's like, a, you can understand the, uh, the loading like the contribution of the specific protein to the specific uh, PC principal component. So in next, we will see, here is just to show you as well as some simple plot. Uh, we know the percentage oh okay in order to make the plot we need to make the this window panel larger so this plot just uh, show remember the percentage of variance it's the different so x is x is a, x, x is a different component pc and the y axis is the percentage of variance for each and as we always know, the first of the PCAs of uh, order the ranked based on their variance. So the first two here occupy most of the variance, explain most of the variance. And then we can also plot the, so remember when we returned it here, we have the second row. This plot, plot just a, like a uh, plot the second row. And then we also can plot the third row, which is a cumulative proportion. So, see here, the first one, the, first, the bar here, again, x axis is different PC, y axis is the percentage, cumulative percentage of uh, this virus. And uh, we can see that first the component PC can explain about like 35% of the virus. And the total, the first two PC probably can explain the 45% missing value. And then finally, all the PCs here will 
they uh, will cover exactly the to all the variance, which is one here, percentage one here. So this just to show you how what the, what the each PC looks like. Then usually what we when we do after we do the PC PC for me usually we, when I use it I use it to like the dimension reduction because if you here you have sixty six proteins and you want to see how the two condition different two condition looks like for the six six sixty six proteins it's hard because their dimension too high it's hard to make a plot it when we, but we for PCA is we can use the PCA and select the first two P components and make a plot, two dimension plot. So here is what we are going to do is we will we will make plot for PC1, PC2. So in order to make plot, I think if someone attended the basic uh no beginner uh beginner R last week, we will um, it has already introduced to use ggplot2, which is like a very important package in R to make the uh, data, to make plots. We will we need to use ggplot2 to make our following plots. So first, library ggplot2. And in the ggplot2, first plot, we just uh, see what does PC1, PC2 looks like. So if you run it, it will give you a set plot. So x axis is PC1, y axis is PC2, and uh, each point here is one sample. Totally, we will have like there should be two hundred samples, uh, two hundred data points because we have two hundred samples. So now we make the plot for all of our samples. That's why usually, uh, if you use PCA, you you will want to generate certain plot, but still we don't we couldn't see which sample from which group. Then we want to separate the we want to like give different color to the data points if they from they are from different groups. So in next step we just add color to the figure. But in order to add the color to the figure we need to know the group information of each data point. So like each sample information each sample. That's why previously we need to generate the uh, group the uh, annotation vector, the group information vector. So since we previously we generated the annotation, we have a tree annotation matrix uh, data frame which has the group information of each sample. Now we can put the group information in the figure so that we can see how good we separate. So here, okay, let's run it. I think there's probably. So that's the annotation file we, okay. So now that, that's the like, uh, new figure we add the group information. So previous is the same data points. The, the position of data points is completely the same. But now we can know that the red color means the sample from colorectal cancer group, and the blue and the blue one means the sample from healthy group. But that's because you know that's what usually like in our real study we can see it because it's clinical data. If we we probably hard to see here is there is like a like very clear classifier to just classify here. It's still the two groups quite uh, mixed up. And then that's if you have your own data set, you can see whether you if actually if you can see like very clearly, you see the two groups separately. It I I probably see you can use a. It's not very hard for you to do the classification. Because it means your data, at least from the, your data is easy to separate from the two. It, it, your data is easy to distinguish. Um, but here, it can show up that it's probably when we do the classification, we will have some difficulty with it. So, 
And there are also some other options. Here we use different color to show different groups. You can also give like a different shape of, you can also use different shape for different groups. And here is rectangle, right here is circle. But it's awesome uh, plot uh, option. You can change it in GDPlot. GDPlot is very powerful for the database. So we can also, here what we do is we make the plot for, Originally, we make plot for PC1, PC2. Now we can make plot for PC1 and PC3. It just you can explore how does the how do the PC comp the principal components looks like. Here we make a plot for PC2 and PC3. I think it somehow it's it's better than PC1 and PC2. See this this corner both of the samples from correctional. I think from the upper corner they are more healthy samples. <coughs> so that's the I think for the P, uh, PC analysis, uh, PC uh, A analysis the figures you want to generate, we may want to generate. And the one last thing for PCA is just to show you what does the we can also make figure for the rotation, the loadings. So for example, that's how the rotation matrix looks like. So the columns are just PCA, and the row is different proteins. The, as I said, the number here is the rotation, which is the coefficient of. So for each component, each column, if you look at each column, the number here is the coefficient for each protein, which is the contribution of each protein to each component. And we can also make a plot to visualize it. So for the plot here, See that this plot will just show you how what that um, just make it um, visualize the component, the loading. So each color and um, x axis is different protein. This plot is for PC one. So each pro here is the different proteins, and the corresponding bar is the coefficient of different protein. And then from this plot, you can know which protein, like a, more clearly to see which protein has. Uh, largest contribution to PC1. As you see here, I think probably the last protein here, and this protein, they have, these two have the largest contribution to the PC1. Here, this product just help you to identify which, which proteins contribute most to the PC1 or PC2. You can change, so for example, uh, So, for example, here, if you want to plot like PC2, you can change the number like PC2, PC3 here to make other plot. For example, if we want to see what's the loading for PC2, we can just change the number, the name here, and it will give you the. It will give you the contribution. So here, probably for PC2, this protein gives us the, give it the contribute most to it. So all these plots are made in uh, ggplot2. Uh, okay. So I think that's all uh, the plots we made for PCA. Um, if you have question about PCA part, you can ask. So, and everyone has this plot. If you have it, please put the blue note. Okay. Yeah. So, here, in order to use, use digiplot, uh, we can um, just very very simply explain. So in order to use, use the ggplot, you need to first tell it what's your data set. Here is something called data, and that's our data set. And then you, in the data set, the data set must be some data frame. 
it has different columns, and each column is different like attributes, and then each row like what each row has different uh, sample. So here we just see we have data set which has two columns, uh, not two columns. We have all the rotations. So it, the rotation we have 66 columns, which is 66 PCA PC, and then we have one additional column which is the protein name, and then we want to make the plot. So we tell ggplot x axis here should be protein. And the y axis here should be PC2. So because this is this plot is quite special in uh, ggplot tool, usually you will only have x and y, but here the plot we want to make is a segment plot, which means you want to make you want to make a segment, plot a segment in the figure. So then for the segment we need to know. What's the x the start point of x and what's the end point of x? For example, it starts from here for x axis and um, it, it's the end of it's here. And at the same time, we want we also need to, in order to specify the segment, we also need to show it what's the start point of y and what's the end of y. So in order to make the plot for segment, you need to specify four different values. For x, we always hope it's always the same x because we want is the, the uh, what we want. And also for y, it starts from zero and the end point is exactly the loading. So that's how you make a, a segment plot in ggplot2. And then you specify the x, y, and then here, that first step, you always need to tell the ggplot what's the data, what's the x and the y, and then after you tell it to your data, you can next step here use class symbol to see that I want to make a tier segment plot. And then if in our previous case, what we show it like here in this plot, for example, the previous plot, we again we show it the data um, for them here. Again, we first say we have this data set, and then our, we want to make a plot which x axis is PC2, y axis is PC3, and then we want to give the different color. So for, after you specify PC1 and PC2, you will have like each data point, and then I want to see the color of data point is based on their group, and the shape of the, color, the, the data point is also based on the group. Then you just tell all the required information to make a plot. So after that, you have the information. Here you can see I want the, I want to make a point, so which is the scatter plot. So in this case, you just see what kind of plot you want to make. And inside of the parentheses, you can specify, for example, a scatter plot. So what the size of the point and uh, here alpha is see how heavy the color is. And also you can change like how the background looks like and what the size of the axis label. In in GDPROP 2 you can change everything, all this. So yeah, this is just to like brief very briefly introduce the PCA until now. And then in next step we will see how you can make heat map. Uh, that's a question yes. about the PCA. Uh, so one question is that for the loading of the post event active and active means it's a active will a very also very strong the loading the input the print of the And uh, also another question is that uh, I think uh, Volga said that uh, this uh, PCA cannot can only be used to quality control. So when we got to the loading information, what can we do for this information? How we get to have the conclusion from that? Um usually I see from loading, I could I really didn't make a conclusion from loading. So why we need it? Oh, it just uh, you need to load you need loading information to generate the PC. Okay. It's like here just uh, the parameter is the algorithm. The algorithm needs to estimate some key parameter. Loading is the parameter, so you have to have that. So. One thing I can use, I may see is, for example, 
you have P PC1, PC2. You find, okay, PC1, PC2 is quite important. Like, they can separate the data set where the two conditions very well. Then you probably want to know, like, for PC1, which proteins most correlate, like, contribute most. So probably you can tell, oh, this protein is a very important protein for classifying the two groups. That's one thing I can tell from the loading. Because usually for PCA, I will, for me, I will just make this plot to see what, it will give me a sense like wider the data can, we can, so it's easy or very hard to separate the different conditions. That's usually when I use PCA. So, also, sometimes, um, for example, if we have like thousands of proteins, and we only have maybe in like proteomics like 100, 100 samples, if you try to build a classifier based on such amount of such data set, usually you have too few samples, you have too large, uh, like the, uh, too many proteins. It usually it means you can very easily to make overfitting because your sample size is not enough. So people will use PCA to do to like make the get the P, um, principal components and maybe only select the first five or ten PC to train the classifier again, which means you can reduce your dimension like from thousands of protein to hundred proteins. So people will may use PCA to do the um, dimension reduction. So there are two ways. So you can do dimension reduction, you can also do feature selection. But in this case, when you do the dimension reduction, you don't have the protein anymore. So PCA is just a combination of all the protein. So that means you don't have the very specific, clearly um, biological interpretation of the markers, the biomarkers you selected. You will have a prediction model classifier, but uh, each um, feature of biomarker in the classifier, it doesn't have a very clear biological interpretation because you combine all the proteins. Then at that time, you may want to look, go back to the loading to see, okay, for this very important uh, PC, very important biomarker, uh, not like biomarker, like very important uh, feature in the classifier, which protein has the most contribution. That's you may want to look at that. So could you suggest that you can use it, still for use it for feature selection and use these proteins to, uh, to build as a model for the, uh, uh, the, the samples to predict that they are... Uh, you just see, you may want to look like a more closely to that protein, at that protein. So, and then next, okay, next we will, okay, we still have like around half hour. So, let's a little, go a little quicker. So, for heat map, uh, again, you have the data set, and then you want to make a heat map. So, here, let's first uh, give it another name. Here, first step is just to give, uh, to assign the data set because sometimes when I read the article, it just my uh, habit is we we may made some change to H, the HTA data, but if we change the data, if we directly change on this data, probably sometime later you found okay there I made something wrong and you couldn't go back to the original that you need to rerun all the process. So usually before I do that, I will just uh, give it to. Uh, uh, another assigned to another variable, so I will do all the um, all the uh, command run all the command on the new variable, so it will not change the previous data. So here, you after you have the data set, you can in for heat map we use a function just called heat map. <laughs> it's in R, so you don't need to load any package to run that. So that is the it's included in basic R. So for that, you can just click that first one. We just need to run the heat map. So that's how the heat map looks like. Here, uh, each row, I change the axis. See, when I here, I change the uh, um, x 
total and those. So here each row is each um, protein and each column is each sample. And that's usually how you see here. Because we give a yeah, we give we change the parameter here. Skill we in this heat map we doesn't do any skill. And then if it doesn't do any skill, it means the protein, so each row is each protein. So it means the protein abundance we know, different protein, the range of protein abundance may be quite different. For example, here, this those this protein, their abundance is quite low, and the other protein, their abundance are very high. So in this case, all the color will come from. So it's hard to see the difference in the sample because our objective is to see the to classify different samples. But sometimes you may want to classify different protein, but most of the time we want to classify different samples. Here, we, it's very hard to see the difference between samples because the, the difference between proteins will dominate the color. The next step you can show, first we see we don't want to do any skill. Next step we want to see, we want to scale the row which is protein. Then that's the heat map you can see. So as you see all the PCL heat map, as long as you have the good format input, you can just a very simple run the you can run the, the command is very simple, it's just one and two and everything. So all I think most of the code comes from the prepare of the input. So again here we can see probably something here is quite high abundance in this part. And this part also see those samples have high abundance. And the first like several samples they have very low abundance. Uh, relatively low abundance. So the dendro graph here is we do cluster for row and for this is a cluster. So we do cluster for row for protein, we also do cluster for samples. And then next we all can also see we want to scale the column which is the sample. Then you see when you do the scale the sample, the protein will also dominate the again the color. So this is a very simple heat map. You can just like only one here, so nothing. You don't. You can also like a, you know you you don't need to specify the skill neither. There is also default. Default is row, so the default it will do the row center, row skill. So you can very simple just run. In R for heat map, you can just only this. It will give you a heat map. So you that's very simple one. And thing for heat map, that's you, you can get your heat map. So there are but there are some other parameter options where you can exploit a little bit. So for example, for this heat map, if sometimes because we most for for me probably for this data set we want to see the cluster for the samples. We the cluster for proteins is not that important for us. So we can tell the heat map that I don't want to do cluster for protein. Press only do cluster for sample. Then what we can do here is uh, you can, so we have the code here, but if you want to only do, for example, cluster for column here. Oh, sorry. Yes. So it means this this command, uh, parameter means whether you want to do cluster for row. Now we want to see, we don't want a cluster for row, so just put an A here. Then it will not, it, it, will, not, it will not do cluster for row. See, now we don't, we don't cluster the column, uh, the row now, the proteins. We also, we only cluster the samples. So it's not that bad because still you see there are two quite clear there are two clusters here. Because we have two conditions. Yes. Uh you mean which one? Uh you can change the so one way you can change the font here, very small. Then you can see it. But 
uh, usually it's really hard to see the label in Hitmap because see here are like 200 labels. Yeah. So in our studio, when, uh, we can also zoom in, you know, zoom in here. If you have like a very big monitor, you probably can see the row here. So another option, as we said, we want to change the font of the label here. Because we, if you want to see it, you need to make it very smaller because there are 200. So then we can change the size of the row axis. So for example, we want to change the size of column to maybe as here 1.6 let's see how what would it happen not too much change even maybe smaller see now it becomes even smaller but still it's too small it's very hard to see it but that's the one way you can separate the label here make it very small and we can also change the rows um, label, like labeling smaller. For example, row. This uh, option is to just change the size of row label and the column label. Probably we want it to be again six. I think not small enough. But if you zoom in, it, I think it's small enough now. Uh, still a little. Let's change it even later. Now, I think probably if you, we can see something here for the row label. But still it's quite small. So then here just the option, you can change the size of the label. And then if you see, if you don't want to do the cluster for the column for samples, you can change it to see like um, column, yes, NA. So it will, will only do cluster for proteins, not for the, uh, not for the samples. So that is just uh, some parameters you can change. It just make your kit map like more pretty. Mm. And one last thing is very also very important. is see, we have the heat maps. The row columns are different samples. And then, for example, uh, let's go back to. Let's go back to this figure. So we will we only do the sample we only do the sample cluster. It seems like there are two samples, but uh, the size of sample is not that uh, doesn't match with our expectation. Because remember, we have two two condition. Each condition have one hundred samples. So if there are like two cluster, one cluster, they have equal size. That, that would be better. Then we want we have cluster here. We want to validate whether the cluster is cluster is right or not. So then we can each column here is one sample. So we can put the label of sample here. If the cl cluster match match with the label, then it means your cluster is correct. It's like a good. So next thing, let's put the label in the heat map. So. Again, we need to go back our cluster information. So we have two we have two conditions, and the cluster and the label information is in the matrix train. I know. Here, this uh, this um, data set will give us the label information. So and now we need to so. Here is, you can specify the, you can give a bar here, and you can specify the color of the bar based on group information. So what we do here is, we give color based on the, like a ggplot tool, we, give the, we make the color based on the group information. So for example, first we make all the, the whole, all the samples have blue color. That's what this line makes do, this uh, command does. And then, 
if the group, if the sample is from group correct group, they will make the color change the color to right. Right. So beginning, we just see colorectal cancer group red color, and if it's a healthy group, blue color. That's the two mind mix. Now you will have some vector which which tell you the color for each sample. See, this is red is colorectal cancer, and uh, colorectal uh, CRC sample blue is the healthy sample. So then we give this color to heat map. There is a command in heat map is color set color. So it means the column set colors. You see, you can give uh, the, each column of uh, colors on this like, bar on the top of it. So, but you need to specify what color you give to it. Here we generate a color based on group information. Then, see here, we will have the, so still same heat map, but now you have the color bar here. Color here indicates the factor, uh, the group condition of each sample. So, that's, see, our, it's the, like some clinical data sets. The, hard, the difficulty is here. It's very hard to see, the cluster seems doesn't, does not match with our, it's the ground truth, the condition. We can just tell, it's very hard to see the difference. Probably, I feel it's uh, not uh, like some Python. For example, maybe this time, more red color means it's colorectal cancer. This side probably more blue color, which is healthy. We can only tell that, but not very. So there is no very like a clear two cluster. So there are two cluster, but the cluster doesn't match with our condition. Well, yeah. So what? Uh, yes. Um, but not for this function. So there are some other co uh, like uh, other package in R, but you need to split. Here, you need to install other package to put two color bars. So, first color, I, I did it before, and the first color bar is for group, second color bar sometimes you see. For disease, for the colorectal cancer, you may have like a different uh, stage, like one, two, three. Then you can put the stage information on top of it. But for the basic heat map function, it uh, couldn't do that. But there are some other, I think I remember there are some like uh, advanced uh, uh, heat map package in R, like heat map 2, and they, pro they can do that to add two color bars. Yeah. So I think um, for heat map, one thing I've, I need to mention here is uh, so. If you notice, probably you didn't notice, but when we try different whether skill or not skill, you can see that there is the cluster here doesn't change. So the cluster here, if you, oh, let's try it again. So if you don't do, now we do skill. That's how the cluster looks like, the dendrogram. But if we see, I don't want cluster. I think it's only. So the color change, but the, cl the cluster, the clustering is the same as before. It doesn't change. So that's when, like, uh, that's for the heat map, this specific function. If you want to run, you use this function, you probably need, want to be uh, careful is they do cluster on the raw data. Even you say, I want to do scale, the scale only change the color of the heat map. It doesn't change the cluster. So it always does the cluster on the raw data. And then after they do the cluster, 
they will do they will do scale the data and make the change the color. So it means it doesn't really do color. It does it does not really scale the data. So sometimes you may want to you know. Um, so if you really want to do the cluster like heat map on the skilled data, you need to skill it by yourself manually. The, you need to manually skill the data and give it to heat map. Then, for example, um, okay, here. Uh, so you can there are some command here. I show it later. So you can skill the data set by yourself. So in this case, I skill it. We well, skill is first the minus mean and divided by the standard error, a standard deviation. So we skill the we skill the data set, and then let's put it to the. Let's give the skill data to heat map. Somehow. Okay, let's remove that. Yes, so see that's a command we run. Now the cl the, the cluster change. Previously, remember we have two clusters here. Like one is here, another one. Is here. But here it's here from this one. It's hard to see like a, like several clusters. There's no no very clear two. So that's just a way you, if you probably for your data set you want to try both the case, which see which one can give you like a, a better cluster. That's the lot I think, and I also have some code that you can change. There are you know for um you see for the heat map you can always see try different color skills to see which color give you the best visualization, and. Uh, I also there are also some other like uh, code. I probably will don't have time to do it uh, to explain one by one, but basically here we just you can use some define the color by yourself. So here I just uh, I make some my color which is based from red to blue, dark blue to dark red, and see it looks better than the uh, yellow golden one. So, more clear for from here, see you, this cluster, it has like higher abundance relatively, and uh, the other color cluster has some lower like, abundance. So, this way, just uh, you can look at the code of class. This code, you see, previously we all used the default color in heat map in the function, but you, at the same time, you can also specify the color, like here. The option you can give you can create your own color and give it to function. So yes, and there is some other option you can also change the color. Some other option for color, yeah. This is another way you can create your own color. Just because uh, uh, we want to make uh, the heat map color reflects that. If there are difference between the two abundance, we want the, they are, they, their color can reflect the difference. So that's why we try to, we will try like different color to see which one can give us like better visualization. So, okay, I think, let's see. Yes, so now we just see, we we'll try different color and different options for heat map. And then, uh, okay, for heat map part, um, do you have questions? If you okay, if you feel good, we can go to the last part. I think it's for our classification. In this case, in this section, because we don't have a lot of tab, we will train only one classifier, which is random forest, and we will see how you have the random how you train the random forest based on the about, uh, training data and validation and predict the validation data so for classification we have already had, uh, had our training data before so it's exactly the format we want but after we train the random forest we also want to 
we have the classifier. We want to use it, so we need to predict another validation set. In this study, colorectal cancer study, we have our in, another independent validation cohort, which has like 100 uh, healthy subjects and 169 um, colorectal cancer subjects. So we have already read the read in the training data. Now we need to read in the color, we need to read in the validation data. So I think. Again, you can do uh, like the step here to read the validation data from MS stats, but due to time reason, let's just directly read it from the folder I sent to you. Like here is train. You can click the valid, valid abundant data. So just click the data like valid abundant RBA. It will read in the about uh, validation data. So, but of course, if you run the code I show you here, you can just uh, get the abundance metric from the very raw spec like a spectral data, peak intensity data. So now, just uh, for time, uh, saving time, let's start from the data metric. Now, if you have the, you can see the validation data metric in your R's. And if you have the data set, please put the pink, uh, no, blue note in front. OK. So then we have the, we have the training data, we have the validation data. So remember, after you have the, the data metric for validation, you also, we also want to Sometimes, for this case, we know the ground truth for the validation. So we also have want to keep the ground truth for validation so that we can know how well we predict the validation. Then we do the same thing as before to extract the phenotype, you know, the group information from validation. So it's this case. Oh, so oh, we need to do, I forgot that. So for validation, we also need to impute it. At, at in the same way, at the same way as the training. So these two then just impute the validation data. So it use the same one, we use the minimum value for across all the run to impute the missing value. And then we have the, we want to extract the for all of this, we want to extract the ground truth the group information for validation. So uh, if you look at this, this is the annotation for validation part. So from after this two code, we have the protein, we have the training data and the group information for training data. We have the validation data and we have the uh, annot uh, group information for validation data. So then we are going to do the, uh, to train the classifier. So first, we need to load the random forest. Let's first uh, do run the set seed. Uh, because in, OK, in the, it's a warning, so it, not, it doesn't matter. So in random forest, we will do some random sampling procedure to see, to you see which so you just remember in random forest it does some sampling procedure. It means you if you run the random forest classifier two times, you probably can get will get different results. But not too much difference, but still you probably will get different results. And then in order to make your results reproducible, you we want to have the same result every time. And then you can get as we just said before. You can give a set seed. You can give a seed to the for the function. Then it will make sure you get the same data results each time. So let's first set seed, and then let load the random forest. So okay. After you load the random forest, you can see how it works. There are so many different parameters in several different parameters in the random forest. I think. We I in the HTML I sent to you in a folder. I I give the like some I give the description of some very important uh, parameters. You can refer to that to see um what you can 
uh, what parameters you need to be careful. But here we will just use all the default parameters. And then before we really run the, uh, the random port here, one last step, we just uh, put the group information in the data set. So in the random policy, you need to tell that's the data set. And uh, here is the formula. Basically, this formula says, I want to predict group with all the other variables. In this, so in this command, we put the group information in the data set. And then uh, we see in the, in the column, we have like uh, all the proteins plus one the column for group. Then here is that I want to use all the proteins to predict the group, the different groups. So then let's see, run it. Then we have the random forest, the classifier. So now you have already trained a random forest classifier. So next time we want to see, okay, what does it look like? So that's the it's some a summary of the random forest. So here I just see how does it performs on the training data. That's the error rate. So now you have a random forest classifier. You you can in in random forest package in the package it will give you a function where pro fun function to like plot. It will make plot of the random forest because in random forest one. Like probably one most important parameter is the number of trees. So remember what is random part? We have first we have decision tree. You can build a tree to decide which sample comes from the sample comes from which group. And then for random part is you have several trees. Then how many trees you can build you want to build is a parameter. In default is there are like five hundred trees. You will build five hundred trees. When you do the prediction it will like you have 500 person, each person will give you a vote to see, okay, this sample is from position, uh, for example, in this group. And then you, the 500 person will give you 500 votes. And the, which can the, 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 can the, the group which gets the most votes will see, which will, is your final prediction. So then, sometimes, you know, when you have more and more groups, you will have the risk of overfitting. This plus problem, just give you to see how many, give you a sense like how many groups, trees you need. So, focus on, so we can only, oh, if you only looks like the, look at the, okay. For blue color, you, can, you only need to like the blue, blue, blue line. After, I think around like 100 or 50, I think 50, after 50 trees, the, it's the prediction error. So lower means better. So I think after 50 trees, the predict uh, the prediction error just a very it is all like converge, not too much difference. Probably it give you sense. You probably want to use only like 50 or 100 trees to predict the to to pre to train the random forest. So next, then after you first have the tree and the, the figure, you see okay probably I want to change the here, I want to go back to change the, we want to retrain the random forest and change the parameter, sorry. Okay. Okay. To probably only, oh, 50. Then you can read. So now you have a new classifier which has like better parameters. This is just to show you for the different classifier they always have some parameters. Uh, what are the op what's the optimum parameters? Oh. Oh. Is there a function to calculate the random forest and yeah. yeah. um, there are also some other functions it provides uh, in random forest, you can, this because it's very simple, you can just make plot. Another way you can do a cross validation for each different number of trees and to see for what's the error it returns. But it's also just, if it depends on what number of trees you try. <laughs> so. And then, 
we can also get for random forest this package is another good thing is it will report give us a it will tell us how what's the importance for each okay let's see the figure here so random forest the function will return the importance for each protein so then you can do feature selection from here you know it will rank the so like the figure here so it will rank the proteins based on its importance in random forest function there are two the, what's, the, what's the importance they, they evaluate they decide the importance based on two um, make evaluation metrics first is so the left side just a very brief idea you have one protein if the protein is very important, imagine. Now, the, the first we use the data set which has the protein A and do the prediction. You will have a predictive accuracy. And if the protein is very important, we remove the protein from the data set. We can expect that the, the predictive accuracy will decrease a lot because if the protein is really help the classification. So this value is just the diff the decrease of the accuracy if we remove that specific protein from the data set. So it means if the decrease, the bigger means better. It means the protein has a very strong influence on the classification. So that's the top 10 proteins based on the decrease of accuracy it returns. And there is also another evaluation metric is called the Gini, which means so in okay that's uh we need to go to the definition like the algorithm itself so for random forest like each we will have like a different tree for example here and we will have several such tree and for each tree the point here is a decision rule for example we say the abundance of protein a is bigger than abundance if the abundance is bigger than five, then the then the sample will we say the sample is from healthy group. If the abundance is smaller than five, okay, we say the sample is from disease group. And then so it means for each protein we can use based on the protein we can separate the sample <coughs> into disease group or condition uh, uh, or healthy group. So if the protein is really very predictive of the colorectal cancer, so then based on that protein, we can very good separate the two conditions. That's how this uh, decrease means, this uh, metric means, this value means. So this value means if we remove the protein, it, like how well, the, that, that value just basically means how well the protein can separate the two two conditions if the pro if the value is very high then mean it means the protein can very good separate very well separate these are uh, uh, classified the two conditions so it will also give you a uh, rank um, and, uh, as you see here the two ranks not they are usually not the, exactly the same but uh, you can find that for example uh, they are not too much. so I also try to figure out which one. Usually, I will use a decrease accuracy, but uh, um, like uh, based on like uh, our dis several discussion about it, there is very tricky. It's very tricky to directly compare them because they reflect different aspects of the classification. So there is no certain way to like a solution to see which one is um, best. Usually, you, you may see, you can look at the rank returned by both of them and see which protein may be very consistently rank in the top. That may be a very good uh, biomarker. So, okay, I think after that, we can just uh, uh, make our prediction. Oh, sorry. We just, very last. So, we have the protein, uh, we have the classifier, and then we want to make the we want to make the prediction. Again, same, we give the group information to the validation set. Oh, sorry, here. And then this command here. So 
when you just uh, make the prediction on the validation data. So after you make almost like uh, most of the pre most of the classifier in R, they always use the same prediction, but they will implement their own. So you always see always use prediction to pre make the pre predict function to make the prediction. So now you have your prediction. If you look at it, it will. T I think probably there's uh, the data I save is not the data I want. So sometimes I remove proteins. I probably forgot to save it in the chain validation. So I will send after class. I will send another like a correct uh, validation about this. Probably I remove some protein and. Uh, didn't save the correct uh, abundance matrix, but that's the command like uh, for you. Here, uh, I will send, I will upload the new uh, validation data after class, and you can try the code after class by yourself. So one last thing is, after you made the prediction, after you make the prediction, you can how to see well how well you can see, um, how to assess the prediction. I for here I provide the code for two way. First, you can calculate the predictive accuracy, and which and the second there is also another code for you can make an error seeker. I think in August uh, lecture you can you see the error seeker, so you can try it after class that how to make error seeker. This exactly show you the way to make error seeker and calculate the predictive accuracy. Usually when we have when we uh, make some class classification, we will compare these two uh, values. Yeah. Okay. I think that's all for the classification. And yes. So one last thing we have one last uh, another R scream you can try it later. We that that R scream just uh, describe how to make the estimated sample size for classification problem.